Hey, everyone. Welcome this evening. Um, I'm Marissa Brown. I'm the Assistant Director for Programs up here at the John Nichols Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage. And um, I have the huge pleasure of introducing Becky. But before that, um, I'd like to read a land acknowledgement. I'd like to address the issue of the land that Brown University and that this department and center occupies. Um, a process has been underway over the last six months at Brown to create a meaningful acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples and their connection to this land. This process will take time, deliberation, and care to ensure that this acknowledgement follows indigenous protocols and addresses meaningful action. As this work continues with the guidance of our colleagues at the Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative, it's important to acknowledge this center's role in displacement and name the violence that has been done to this land, to people and to wildlife, and to acknowledge that this displacement and violence continue to this day. Um, so Becky, it's such an honor, such a privilege, honor and excite, excitement, I think for everyone here to have you here tonight. Um, I'm sure everyone, many in this room are familiar with Becky's work um, and are as big a fan um, as, as I am and we all are. Um, Becky is, has a research-based arts practice that um, where center, she centers sculpture as a mode of expression that utilizes objects, images, performance, video and sound. Um, I am just going to kind of give you an update quickly over what she's been up to over the last few years. If you go back further than two years, we'll all be super depressed about how little we do because if you go and sort of see every uh, exhibition that she has been involved in, both in her work, in curating, um, the community engagement, the community service she does, um, which is really deep and impactful uh, in Rhode Island. But I'll just kind of gloss it really quickly and then Becky can um, show some of her work to Today. So she, Becky is a guest artist at Mount Holyoke College. Um, these are just a, right now and over the last few years has um, is an adjunct lecturer at Brown, um, has been an invited critic at the Steel Yard, a workshop facilitator at the National Park Service in Providence, a workshop instructor at RISD Museum, um, and an invited critic many, many, many times um, at RISD. That is her teaching experience. Um, she won the Public Humanities Scholar Award from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities in 2021. Her work has been featured in a range of exhibitions, including Play Cousins at Hera Gallery in South Kingstown, Asterisks in the Grand Narrative of History um, at the Longwood Center for Visual Art in Farmville, Virginia, Unprecedented at Burlington City Art Center in Burlington, Call and Response in the Newport Art Museum. So that just goes back to 2020, I'm not even done, but now we're gonna keep skipping on to other things that she's been doing. Um, she is very much in demand as a speaker um, and also really in demand as a collaborator. Um, I think that you know many people know uh, if you're working on any project that engages with um, art, with public history, with site, and really thinking you know deeply about um, those issues in Rhode Island, I think Becky is probably the first person that many people turn to. Um, and from her CV, she says yes very often. So that's, that's nice. Um, and I, I do want to mention the com community involvement and service because I think that's been so important for us who live here because we really benefit from it. Um, she serves on the governor's portrait committee um, appointed by Rhode Island Secretary of State Nellie Gorbea, now also uh, Dirt Palace Public Projects where she serves as a board member. She's a board member with AS220. She's on the special committee for the review of commemorative works of art in Providence. And she serves on the BIPOC advisory board for the South Kingstown School District. Um, so without further ado, we are all really excited to hear what you've been up to. Thanks for being here, Becky. Thanks everyone for being here tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I would like to open this space with gratitude. Um, gratitude to all of you for your time and attention. Um, Thanks to the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities for creating this space and inviting me to participate in it. Thank you to Marissa for the wonderful uh, and very generous introduction. Um, thanks to Dietrich and Sabina for their 
labor and care in facilitating uh, the series. Um, thank you to the elders and ancestors of the Narragansett Nation uh, on whose land we are currently uninvited guests. Uh, thanks to the elders and ancestors of the Muskogee Creek Nation of the land on which I was born. An infinite gratitude to my own elders and ancestors for their unyielding uh, care and the joy, labor, deeds, and sacrifices that they made uh, to make my life possible. My name is Becky Davis. I'm a daughter, a mother, an artist, a dreamer, a creator, a student, an educator, and a queer Black woman. I often say that I am also a river. A river runs from its present in one place to its future in another, gradually and meticulously um, shaping its surroundings along the way. The women in my family are also rivers, recorders and keepers of recipes, tr traditions, portraits, stories. Following their example, I found that the events of the past simultaneously shape our present and future. I work across media, collecting still and moving images, documents, sound and oral narratives. This collection of evidence is combined with my own interpretation and response, um, creating a new history and personal geography. Accepting this role as past keeper, present shaper and future builder comes with responsibilities. The stories of the past are a gift they hold knowledge, wisdom, complexity, and mystery. It is my task to hold them, to keep them, to distill their lessons, to apply their wisdom in my own life, and to pass them on intact and with annotation. Um, I've been thinking with intention about my relationship to water for several years now, and it all started with Charity Ann. Charity Ann was my fourth great grandmother. I grew up hearing stories about how she, as a child, was kidnapped on the banks of the James River in Virginia and sold south into slavery. She grew into a woman in Georgia, about 40 minutes north of where I was born and grew up. Uh, she was enslaved on a farm. Uh, Charity Ann was the mother of 16, and each of her children was fathered by the son and namesake of the man who enslaved her. Isaiah Parker Sr. So um, starting here, uh, I wanted to start with um, where I grew up. I'm from Columbus, Georgia. Uh, this is the Horace King Bridge in uh, Columbus, Georgia. It connects Columbus with Phoenix City, Alabama, which is right across the, the Chattahoochee River here. The Horace King Bridge was designed by an architect, an enslaved man, Horace King. The title of this talk or this presentation is a citation of uh, Toni Morrison's uh, side of memory, uh, which in which she says, all memory has perfect, or sorry, all water has perfect memory. Um, it's forever trying to get back to where it was. In 1850, a 20-year-old female mulatto was listed. So I'm sorry, the sound isn't working, but I'll recite this. So this is the opening scene from my thesis work titled, Whose Name Was Written Water. Um, it is an experimental documentary that uh, talks about my relationship and explores my relationship with uh, Charity Ann. So it starts in 1850. A 20-year-old female mulatto was listed on the Parker family slave schedules. 11 years later, her name appeared on the inventory of her enslaver's estate when he died.
So this video. Um, uses medium. It was the first time I actually explored water as a medium for ancestral connection. Um, in addition to uh, looking through these documents that basically outline these family stories, um, improve uh, family stories that I always grew um, up listening to from my great grand, told by my great grandmother. Um, it re examines my personal relationship um, with the acknowledgement that the water that I ingest, the water that I surround myself with, the water that I encounter on a daily basis is the same water that Charity Ann encountered um, in her life. Uh, and that this constant recycling of water connects us through space and time. So whose name was written water uh, was, um, a 16 minute experimental documentary that explored those themes. I also wanted to pause just before going into uh, my current projects to talk a little bit, um, or just to give you a sampling of some of the uh, things that inspire me. I'm inspired by material culture uh, from the past and present that explore water uh, and the connection of um, my community um, and my family uh, to water, whether it be through foot washing or baptism that I witnessed as a child growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, um, movies, music, and texts. Um, this is a verse from Earthseed, the Books of the Living, uh, from Parable of the Talents by Octavia Butler. To survive, let the past teach you. Past customs, struggles, leaders and thinkers, let these help you. Let them inspire you, weigh in you, give you strength. But beware, God is change, past is past. What was? cannot come again. To survive, know the past, let it touch you, then let the past go. Now, although this text doesn't explicitly mention water, to me, the way she's describing um, being touched but not able to hold or grasp on tangibly to the past, um, it gives me a visual of water washing over me or a baptism of sorts, not being able to, like being immersed in something, allowing it to touch you, but then letting it um, move uh, forward or move away with you changed after. So the first uh, piece that I wanted to share with you uh, is a work titled For My Mother. Um, so this piece was in the um, column response uh, exhibition at the Newport Art Museum uh, that Marissa mentioned earlier. Um, it was inspired by a number of things, but I'll just um, talk to you about the main inspiration for it. So uh, the column response project was uh, a, a prompt given by the museum's curator, uh, Francine. Um, so the prompt was to find um, a piece of work that belonged in the museum's collection that you're inspired by and to respond to that. Uh, so uh, I picked um, an artwork by um, um, a, an artist, uh, Deborah, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm missing the name. Um, it will come to me. Uh, so uh, this artist was a Providence-based uh, artist who taught at RISD. Um, a painter, uh, and her work dealt a lot with layering um, objects, layering items, layering space. Uh, and so I decided to work off of that um, premise, this idea of um, layering space, but also layering time. Um, I also responded to the prompt itself. Um, call and response reminded me of call and response music, particularly um, in regards to gospel music. And so um, during this time, this prompt was given in uh, like the 
very like early on or like early summer of 2020. Um, and at that time, I was thinking a lot about the music that I had grown up with. Um, and so I wrote a poem that combined um, couplets. So the first line of the couplet was a song from um, my childhood, a gospel song from my childhood. The second line of the couplet was a, uh, a line that I wrote in response to that. Um, so it was in itself a call and response. That poem appears in the painting um, along like as an image transfer in the painting. And then that's combined with the photograph. Um, I was thinking about uh, baptism here, but also ancestral connection um, and thinking a lot about um, just hope. This piece, uh, the installation that was up in uh, the Newport Art Museum led to a performance of the same name um, that was featured as part of uh, a incredible perf um, performance series titled Fire Flowers in a Time Machine that was uh, curated and directed by Shea Rivera Rios um, and produced by the Wilbury Theater. So um, for Fire Flowers in a Time Machine, I would perform um, a 15 minute piece where I recited the, the poem. So the series of couplets, uh, there was um, a soundtrack that I constructed out of um, Sounds of Water. So it mimicked the, uh, the water cycle. It started with rain. Um, or a single drop of water. That drop of water turned into rain. Uh, the rain then turned into a rushing river, which moved into uh, the waves, the ocean waves. And then everything sort of shifted at a crescendo and started working in reverse until it ended uh, the way it began. So the idea of um, this sort of connection, this endless cycle was also coupled with um, my uh, movements or my actions. So um, this work featured me giving myself a, uh, a spiritual bath of sorts or um, a self baptism where uh, I prepare water um, and I bathe myself uh, all through in, in an effort to um, reconnect with Charity Ann. So in the beginning, um, as the water cycle is starting, I trace, uh, I prepare the water. I trace Charity Ann's name on the stage. Um, then I proceed with the bath and the, uh, the uh, performance ends with me tracing Charity Ann's name again, uh, but in reverse. And it starts um, as it stops. So another uh, piece that I want to share with you is whose name was written water. So this was um, a work that was in response to the original whose name was written water, which was a video work, uh, but it was also kind of a continuation of that, uh, that mode of engagement. So it featured footage from the film, but also a lot of new footage. Uh, this was produced by uh, the Wilbury Theater. Um, and it examined not only the sort of connection between myself and Charity Ann, uh, but what I was sort of dealing with or working through at that present moment. Um, at the time, my son was graduating from high school. And so this, uh, this piece includes um, sort of navigating that space um, and created, well, the attempt was to create a portal through which he could uh, become an adult. Uh, and so he was uh, actually performed along with me. These photos were taken by Aaron X Smithers. So in the, the crescendo or the, the set piece of the original video uh, was a recitation of a, of, um, of, in inventory. So one of the main sort of documents that I found while researching Charity Ann was an inventory uh, of uh, Isaiah Parker Sr.'s estate. When he died, it was the one place where she was named as a person, uh, where her name was actually listed uh, rather than um, 
in slave schedules, which uh, if you're not familiar in slave schedules, uh, enslaved people were um, stripped of their identity. Um, they were stripped of their name and they were only given uh, or only listed as a, a number of uh, descriptive words, um, age, um, sex, uh, and color. Uh, so in that original video, I recite the inventory word for word. Um, and while I'm doing that, there's this overlay of, of water um, and the writing of the, I'm also writing the inventory and the action of me writing the inventory is reversed in order to try to um, grapple or undo the effects of this history that can't be erased. So the way I, brought that into um, current times or the, the way I sort of tried to incorporate things that I was feeling at the time and things that we were going through at the time um, was uh, while this inventory was being read or um, recited in, in a recording, I um, greased my son's scalp and we recite the names of uh, the lost uh, the people who have been lost to, um, to police violence just in uh, the previous 20 years, sorry, 12 months. So the previous year. I'm gonna show you a short video that was uh, produced by Oliver Sideshow Arias. So this video, um, this performance was um, not your typical performance. Uh, there wasn't a live audience. Uh, the way it was constructed was as a, uh, a virtual, a 3D virtual reality experience. Um, so uh, folks would um, receive a link, they would log in, and I, my son and I would perform this, uh, perform live uh, three days a week. Um, so we performed in a very closed space. Um, it resembled a home space uh, surrounded by three projections. One projection sort of uh, symbolized my um, interior life, my interior world. One uh, projection connected me to the past and one, uh, the, the third projection connected us to the outside world or the landscapes. So um, uh, uh, the third work that I want to share with you uh, today of the four um, is a piece uh, that was um, produced for Tidal Resonance. So Tidal Resonance is um, a series of work that was done in uh, collaboration with Prov Providence uh, Waterways and uh, Project Open Doors. Uh, it was uh, curated by um, Shea Rivera Rios. Uh, and um, Seth, uh, um, excuse me, um, uh, Seth or Terji, sorry. <laughs> so um, this performance or the series, uh, there were two different um, items that were included in this project. There were, was a day of performances, uh, and um, a actual, like these performances that live in the site uh, through an app. Um, and I actually, uh, if you would like to, they're having a new um, series of like kind of an open house where you can come and a group of people can uh, uh, experience these, uh, this app 
that where the um, sound, uh, they're kind of like sound uh, walks or sound explorations that live on the site. Um, and this will happen November 14th uh, from 10 to 10.30 to 12 at India Point Park. Uh, I uh, would like to um, encourage you all to go. There's a number of incredible artists that will have um, work that uh, you can experience on site, including uh, Mary Kim Arnold uh, and Jenea Kizzy. So um, my contribution to this project was um, a performance that I titled uh, We Are Rivers. Um, so there were two parts to the performance. The first was the making of this um, object. Um, and so, I uh, crocheted um, what I considered uh, a maquette of a river, of the Chattahoochee River to be specific. Um, something that I really enjoy about uh, crocheting is that it, um, it's a very intentional action. Um, it takes a lot of time uh, and care and thoughtfulness and um, just being present. <laughs> uh, so in creating this object, um, it was a practice of, of breathing, of breathing intentionally as I made each link um, and of making a very sort of um, specific set of links. So the Chattahoochee River is 444 miles long um, and this river or this maquette of the river has uh, 422 links in it. Uh, and I brought it with me today. <laughs> So the second uh, part of this project was the actual performance. So um, at India Point Park, uh, I did a, a live performance where I invited folks to, I shared three memories um, that were associated with waterways. Um, and then I prompted uh, all of my viewers or all of the participants, people who were present in the park to share uh, three memories um, distilled into three words with me. Um, and they wrote those words down on slips of paper. Uh, and then um, I went to each person and they recited their three words to me. Uh, and then I invited them to attach their memories to the river. Um, the idea was that we are all responsible for, um, for holding and keeping these memories, these stories and passing them forward. And so, uh, in the sharing of, of the stories, uh, we all become guardians, we all become custodians of, of the stories. So the last work that I wanna share with you uh, today is a project that I just finished. Um, it opened at the beginning of the month. Uh, so this is a collaboration with Holly Ewald titled uh, Unpolished, sorry, Unpolished Echoes. So Unpolished Echoes is uh, the second of um, a series of projects that Holly and I have collaborated on. This is Holly on uh, the far left um, installing. Uh, so this is, uh, will be on view at the Museum of Natural History at Roger Williams Park until April. Um, this, the original work, Unpolished Legacies, was a response to the um, Gorham show that was um, uh, installed at uh, the RISD Museum in 2019. Um, and uh, so our series of actions was um, in uh, a desire to want to bring the story of Gorham outside of the walls of the museum um, and to allow the community um, a place to, uh, to share their thoughts and ideas and to have conversations about the legacy of, of um, the presence of Gorham uh, at Machapog Park. Um, but also uh, in the broader world. Um, I was personally um, sort of invested and interested in the story of Gorham um, through their uh, bronze division. I've done a lot of work with public commemoration and monuments. And so it was really interesting to me that to find out that um, Gorham Man Manufacturing Company was actually responsible for many of the Confederate monuments that I had encountered in Georgia where I'm from. Uh, so this um, iteration of the project 
actually focuses less on Gorham and more of Mashapog Pond, which is right in Reservoir uh, uh, Triangle, as a site. Um, and the resilience of the, uh, the environmental uh, land there. Um, so there are three different thresholds, um, each one representing um, a different habitat that's present uh, in Mashapog Park. Uh, so the one that you're seeing installed here is water. Uh, so Holly created um, a series of sculptural installations that represent these three habitats. Uh, my contribution was um, uh, a series of images uh, of the three habitats and also a video that lives uh, in the site, uh, which documents the seasonal change across um, an entire year um, of that site. So you see, you get to see how, um, what spring looks like in Mashapog Park, how it turns into to summer, um, then fall coming in and then, uh, the entire uh, park covered with snow. Um, in addition to the um, artistic uh, work, the, the installation and the video, there are also a series of, um, uh, of display cases that sort of draw out additional narratives um, about the importance of, of like cultural and natural histories uh, to those sites. Um, the work, the, this uh, project is, was a large scale project with a lot of collaborators um, and includes the work of, in, in addition to Holly and I, includes the work of uh, indigenous artists, Brenda Hill, Leah Hopkins, Julia Martin, uh, Brittany P. U. Uh, uh, Wanapog Wally, uh, Jonathan Perry, Lucene Reinbold, Kiki uh, Sciola. Uh, Daniel Shears, uh, Robin Spears Jr., and Tina Trithoros. So um, this work uh, couldn't have been made without the help of a number of collaborators and funders, including uh, the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, uh, the Providence uh, Department of Art, Culture, and Tourism, the Rhode Island Historical Society, which we collaborated with, um, and uh, the folks at um, the Tomaquag Museum who worked to help us uh, curate um, and uh, to curate the uh, the display cases, um, and the the help of all uh, a series of folks who offered. Um, their time, energy, and labor, and um, not only helping us find, uh, uncover the research to make this possible, but also um, putting the, the show together. So um, with that, I, I would like to close the, the talk portion of, or the sharing portion of this talk. I do want to sort of, um, to engage you in the conversation. And I would like to start that by uh, sort of facilitating um, an exercise if you all would, would indulge me. So I brought some, uh, some little slips of paper and I thought it would be interesting for us to um, sort of think through our own relationships with water. Uh, and maybe if you would share um, one memory, distill one memory of that you have with water down to one word uh, and record that on the slip of paper uh, and we'll add it to um, my river of memories. <laughs> so I'm going to, can I start here sure. with you? Sure. Yeah. Yes, yeah, just take one and pass them around. Sure. So while these go around, again, I want to thank you uh, for joining me, and I look forward to um, answering any questions you might have and also sharing uh, this time with you and hearing your stories. Yes. I'm just wondering if you can tell us more about how you, like when you, when did you start thinking about water as a concept to understand? 
So for me, it really started, it started with charity and it started with, um, I've also, I've always like felt really closely connected to her story. Um, and of all of the stories that my great grandmother used to tell me, like I always wanted her to repeat the stories of Charity Ann, specifically of her um, being kidnapped uh, on the riverbank um, along with her sister. So the story was that she and her sister were gathering water in the morning um, and that they were kidnapped. It's unclear whether um, they were already enslaved and then sold further south or if they were free and then enslaved, but they never, um, she never saw her sister again um, and she never saw uh, her family again. She was 10 years old at the time. Um, I always, I, I grew up not quite um, a country girl per se. Columbus is kind of, it's a, a town. Um, but when I moved um, as an adolescent in fifth grade, I moved to Louisville, Georgia, which is quite rural. And I spent a lot of time um, on my parents' property. They had uh, several acres. Um, and so our nearest neighbor was about a mile and a half down the road. Uh, so I spent a lot of time just outdoors um, and exploring woods and uh, woodland, uh, um, wetlands. And so, I've just been really personally connected to, um, to the outdoors, to the natural worlds. Um, and thinking about water specifically as like a, a way of connecting um, came through, came to me through reading, number one, through some of the texts that I've shared with you. Um, but also, I, I think the first time that I really thought about the connection. Um, that we have to water uh, and how it connects us through space and time uh, was seeing uh, a documentary called Watermark, um, which was, uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, it's uh, a documentary about an artist's work named Ed uh, Bertinsky. Um, he's a photographer and he um, makes these very large scale uh, aerial uh, shots of, um, of waterways. And so in one of the, the culminating scenes of that movie, he's speaking to uh, an indigenous man there in a, um, in a boat sort of on the water. Uh, and the man is explaining to him how, um, you know, um, as um, how the water connects us in such, it seemed like such a, like something so simple, but it was so profound. And I never thought about it before that the water never changes. Like water is not created or destroyed. It's just recycled. And this idea that like the water that's on the earth now was the same water that existed on the world at the beginning was just like, it was life-changing for me. And it's, that was the seed that planted the seed that, um, that grew into the practice that I have today. You're welcome. So did everyone get uh, a pencil and a slip of paper? Okay. Did everyone have a moment to um, distill their memory? So I know that we can't uh, go through everyone, but if um, several, several of you or a few of you may want to share, to stand and sort of share what you, um, what you've written, uh, I would really appreciate that. Yes, please. So we were just supposed to write one word. Yes. And then, um, so I wrote the word maternal. Um, I find myself having a lot of dreams about water, whether it's like a rough, more violent type of water, like a or I'm just kind of submerged in it and relaxing. Um, so it feels like a protector mm -hmm. in a way to try to make you feel safe, but at the same time, keeping harm away from you. 
Thank you so much for bringing that. I feel, um, yeah, that resonates uh, very deeply. Um, water as a protector, but also as um, something to be to be feared and um, to not be uh, to not take for granted. I would say yes. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for sharing. Is there anyone else? Yes, Marissa. Yes, I, I have two things that I missed, but one no, was please. Um, the water is a protector. Mm. I, I just, I have in my brain, this thing that I only have this one photograph of my daughter when she was two, and she used to take her to this water park for jumping so hard and so long. And I think about that too, and I'm just like, you know, what is that like? Mm. And um, the other thing is the water is a conductor of joy in that memory, but just a conductor of joy. And then I think really just based on what you were presenting, water is a witness. Yeah, I really like both of those. Water as a conductor, like as a conduit, is something that, um, as a medium for travel, like as as something to connect. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Ray. Um, so I've got one thing. It's been an hour, so. Oh yeah, please. <laughs> I think the most important thing um, when you're talking about how water doesn't go anywhere, it's always here. Yeah. Um, reminding me about, uh, I think it's Chris Mason Sharp who talks about uh, the slave folks who had jumped off the ship and how literally, like their DNA, their blood is still in the water. Right. Um, so I started thinking about sweat. Mm -hmm. It's like water inside of us that comes out and is still that same water that's always yeah thank you for summoning uh, christina sharp's name into the space um her work has been very instrumental in how um not only my work but also how i try to show up in the world um i was first introduced to uh, monstrous intimacies, uh, and it really sort of helped me think through a lot of um, the things that went into the original, whose name was written water. Um, so yeah, I, I also, in thinking about um, sort of that reading of, of water, um, I'm reminded of uh, Alexis pulling gums and undrowned um, and how, uh, she thinks of, um, she makes this connection between marine mammals and their way of adapting to not being able to breathe, like to needing air to breathe, um, but being water animals and connecting that with, uh, with the experience of, of Black Americans being in this um, environment where we're constantly, we have to find ways how to breathe um, in an environment that doesn't allow us to do so. I think I saw someone else and thank you. <laughs> Did someone else? Yes, please. Um, I don't know the correct number, but the number of people like the rest of the world in the water. Right. Yeah, it's, it connects us all, <laughs> right? It's a constant exchange. Like we're exchanging water all the time. <laughs> I love that, thank you. So um, thank you so much for sharing your, uh, your words with me. Um, if there's someone who would like to to share more. Um, we have a couple uh, about ten minutes, so if there are any questions, or if uh, we could open up for discussion, if there's anything that anyone wants to talk about, I'm happy to do so. I would also like to ask that um, before you leave, if you could please attach your your um, your word or your text uh, to the river, um, just using the paper clip.
was in the word taken. So yes. I realized that every word I wanted to use was either the second word, but taken out or pulled out or swept away. So I was so aware of it came from my memory. It was the force of water takes over. That's really interesting. Like, yes. Um, the force. <laughs> um, water is a force. A force um, of something that takes, but also something that gives, right? That, that brings as it takes. Does anyone else have something that sort of, or does this bring anything up for anyone? Yes, ma'am. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering for you if the, the, you know, if you tie together your interest as you draw from the water with some of the archival work that you do and kind of the, the you know the, that finding of those gaps in archives and so therefore that feeling of like the past to be quite accessible you know not even in the records that say that that's that we think where we think that the past is somehow accessible i'm just wondering how you if there's a relationship for you in that kind of and what how you you know relate to those archives and what the water does for so if you were saying like it's constancy or it's kind of um, real it's historical, like it's kind of embodying history, I don't know if those two things are related. I'm just... No, I think they're very much related. Um, for me, water is an archive uh, and it, the stories that it holds, I may not necessarily have access <laughs> to, um, but I can imagine, and that sort of brings back up um, side of memory for me and the reason why that text is so sort of pivotal um, to my work in, if, if you're not familiar, so in this writing, um, Toni Morrison is talking about her role as a writer and how, um, how the lineage, the um, artistic or the, the literary lineage um, that she imagines herself to be in um, is this, uh, you know, is belonging to a lineage of um, folks who wrote uh, like slave narratives and how these slave narratives, even though they were supposed to, um, they had a specific goal in mind, right? The goal was to um, encourage people or influence people um, to be abolitionists, to understand the horrors of slavery. Um, but at the same time, like that they're trying to share their personal stories, um, these memories and memoirs that are like are very like close to them. They also have to make them palatable to an audience that they don't want to offend. So there's this constant sort of negotiation, this push and pull. And so she sees herself in that lineage in that um, she doesn't have to convince anyone of anything. Um, what she's trying to do is it, through her work is to create a space for, for these writers or like people like them to regain their interiority to engage, regain their complexity um, uh, and to have access to um, these things that they had to deny when trying to make themselves palatable to a certain audience. So she uses um, her imagination, um, very much informed by archival documents or actual history um, to, to recreate you know, fully fully formed um, human lives. Uh, and so I see 
in, in the way that she describes, you know, water as this, uh, as the substance that holds, um, that holds memory and is always trying to like return to the way, the way it was. Like I, I see water is like a substance that, that indeed holds memories, but you know, I have to use my imagination in the same way that um, Toni Morrison might in order to um, have access to, to the archive that's um, embedded in the water. Yes. Um, if you feel comfortable talking about the passage from Octavia Butler and how you use that for your own centering between being ensconced in the history, but also present thing and like taking care of yourself. And you know, you do a lot of deep work, so it feels like that quote is really something about like a little bit of self care in that space as well. So if you feel comfortable. Yeah. Um. So I kind of found out through working um, that what I was doing wasn't quite sustainable. It was a way of sort of me managing my feelings and trying to find healing for myself and my family but like being enmeshed in histories and stories that are you know horrible uh is hard um but i feel like it's it's part of the way i can find healing for myself so um the other side of that is that I also have to be very intentional about taking care of myself and knowing um, not just focusing on um, what the past is, but also on what the possibilities can be, like learning from it and then, you know, being affected by it, allowing it to speak through me, allowing, um, hopefully it's my it's my hope that um, that my ancestors, that my elders uh, have a voice through me or use me as a vessel. Um, and then, you know, I can, we can move forward together. Thank you for that question. Yes. Um, I was wondering for familiar with the Black Shaman. I just bought it, but I haven't read it yet. <laughs> okay. um, well, I'm reading it for one of my classes right now, and I just was thinking about the concept of water being malleable and plasticity mm. um, in relationship to the Black people and Black people also oftentimes needing to be like malleable in a way that they conduct their lives show up in spaces. Um, and so talking about water between like being a dictator and how rivers carve landscapes um, in conjunction to also being malleable and the way that we as possible have to take on water as well. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I need to sit with that book right away. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, being malleable is, is difficult. <laughs> um, and, but at times necessary. Um, yeah, I'm thinking through that a lot now. Um, when are the times uh, that it's necessary to be malleable and when are the times that it's necessary to hold fast? <laughs> I also think, um, and going back to your statement about like water as mother, uh, I just, I also wanted to point out that I felt a lot of kinship in that, in that, so in For My Mother, um, 
the word mother for me had two separate meanings. So it was kind of like, it was a, a double meaning. It was my mother, um, as in the mother of my family, Charity Ann, but also my mother as in, um, you know, my spiritual mother, um, or water as my spiritual mother. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Think. So um, we've come up on time. Thank you so much for sharing with me, for being here, for receiving um, uh, this work uh, and for your thoughtfulness and questions uh, and uh, for sharing your memories with me.